are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Direct from the Vero Essien Yahad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. Greetings and Shabbat Shalom. This is Jackson Snyder, founder of the Vero Essien Yahad and supervising elder of the New Earth Restoration online Shabbat service. Every Shabbat, 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. And today we have Elder Marcial Logue, who has prepared a dynamic message for you. And if you want to skip to the message, you can. It's about at 16 minutes. But if you have time, listen to the whole thing. You'll enjoy it. I took out quite a bit of it to adhere to our time requirements on Hebrew Nation Radio. And I wanted to give you the opportunity for feedback. If you're hearing this on HNR, complete the form at yahad, Y-A-H-A-D dot me. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and leave a comment. So, in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, let the service begin. This is the 11th month, ninth day, and I'm happy to say that our brother Gray, Norman Gray, who I think is on today, has completed the calendar for 2021-2022. And for those of you that attend today, I would be glad to pass the calendar on to you in PDF form if you notify me through the chat feature here that you want one. I think I have everybody's email address or everybody's uh, SMS here. So if you want a calendar, please let me know. Let me show what it, you what it looks like. This is this is a beautiful thing we've had for the past several years. A beautiful thing. It tells all about the calendar, how it works, shows you how to read it shows you the portals from Enoch, full directions. Here's the month we're in right now, oh, January 2021. And it's kind of got to get used to it at first because you notice for those that see the day starting at sundown, we have the flap up on above of the day. Then we have the uh, the regular secular date here. And we have feasts on here. New Year's the 24th, it's always going to be on a Wednesday. Unleavened Bread is going to be on a Wednesday. Sukkot is going to be on a Wednesday, with the preparation day here being the Passover, the 6th of April. And this goes clear on through January 22 and following. As you know, Norman Gray is an expert on this calendar, and he does this each year. In the past, though, we had hard copies of this, but this year it's just too much work, and the expense is way too much. So we have the PDF, and for those that are faithful to come, we're happy to send it to you. And I suppose that everybody that wants one has put down in the chat that you do. Yes, he deserves thanks and praise. And actually, he's looking for somebody who's interested in calendrical studies to take over this ministry of his. And it really has been a great ministry. You can't imagine how many times we have conferred over the dates. And mm, literally hundreds, if not a thousand of these calendars have gone out. We are really promoting the Zadokite 364 day calendar because that's the old temple calendar before the Sadducees and Pharisees got in to change everything over to the moon. This is a solar calendar as found in Hanuk, Enoch, Jubilees, Dead Sea Scrolls, the MMT, etc. It's everywhere there, but since the scripture had been canonized, these books were left out, leading us to believe that the day starts with the moon. And there's another study here that I got a hold of this week. Another calendar that we got here, or another uh, essay this week, that shows that the Gospel of John uses this calendar for the, the feasts in there. I'm just reading that. Very interesting. Maybe you want to take a look at that, too. So here we go. Ah, while we're at it, why not? Alternative. Okay, don't look at my stuff in here, all right? The alternative is 
the first day of the week, Scripture or Tradition. This is a tremendous book by our brother, Dr. Heston, who's here today. Thick, beautiful book. Got a lot of the original language studies in here. It's just beautiful. You can learn a little more about the Greek and the Hebrew. And one thing I like about this book, besides the appendices, is that you find a lot of gems in here. Things that you really wouldn't expect in a calendar book. Things that, whoa, I've got to get the backdrop back on here before somebody sees my laundry. There's like a gem on every page. I've really enjoyed using this as a reference, but I've got to tell you, there's a little difference there, which I suspect next time Brother Heston speaks, you'll probably want to talk about this a little bit. Where do you get one? Kingdomcart.com. Kingdom cart with a K. Kingdomcart.com. That's our Yahad shopping cart. Go out there. And again, the title is The First Day of the Week. And that is by Mark Heston. Read a little about it. Buy one. It's on big sale right now. I just got some extras for Mark. The ones I had before, I had a bunch of them. They all sold. So we've got it on special just for you. Take a look. All right. Any more announcements for today? Since I really got started with this. Any more announcement? Oh, yeah, I have one more. We are going to start having communion on first Shabbat of the month. We're going to see how it works out. And each first, my background's not up. It shows up now. We can't have that. Oh, well. Communion, first Shabbat of each month. And, of course, you're going to have to bring your own elements. Generally, we're going to use unleavened bread of some kind. And we're going to use, well, traditionally, it is regular wine. Or if you are an alcoholic and you think a little shot of wine is going to get you back off the track, then you can use Welch's grape juice. That will work just as well. We don't want to use hot dog bun and Kool-Aid. Disrespectful. But we'll have the ancient communion services. We already have two of those. And you will enjoy those very much because every aspect of the communion going clear back to the first century is in here from books like the Didache and the, um, oh, what's the name of that? <clears throat> the earliest Nazarene synagogues. <clears throat> Dura Europus, very, very close to that same service there. I wanted to see that chat. Yeah, of course. This is one thing we haven't done here is ask for donations or take up a collection. The Yahad right now is supported by its members. And what its members do is they pay dues, like the temple tax. That is how that they supported the temple. The tithe, of course, is for the priests. The ministers, we don't ask for a tithe, but we have a little dues each month, and uh, uh, hopefully you will want to join the organization at some time. I'm sending out some invitations here this week, and if you're interested in that possibility, go to joinyahad.org, and you'll see the contract of uh, membership in the actual Vero Essene Yahad organization, which is chartered in Florida. It's a legal entity. It is in the IRS records as a church. No, we don't have a 501c3. However, we're grandfathered in, and your donations are tax deductible. This is, we're getting around to tax time. If you have uh, donated to us in the last year, let me know if you want a tax receipt and tell me how much it's for, and I'll send you a receipt right over, and that will be valid. All right, so we're going to turn this over now to our Zoom master today, and that's Kenneth Kimmons, and for the server, Kaizen, see if you can find it. All right, so I'm the host, just take it on down. I've changed this quite a bit. Take it on down, take it on down. Here we are, to we gather and bless Yahweh, up a little bit, right there's where we go. And the, uh, the one that does the unbolted reads the headers. So, you know, we're going through this with people for the first time, so we're going to kind of work our way through it. Who's got the unbold? Right here. Okay. We gather and bless Yahweh. 
And the bolded guy? Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, sovereign of the universe. Baruch atai Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam. Who sanctifies us by your mitzvot and calls us to hear the kol shofar. Asher kitshanu ba mitzvoto v'tzvanu lishmoa kol shofar. Amen. The shofar is... Good. We call upon our Father and the heavenly realm. Avinu Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe. Let our praise, blessings, and prayers rise up through the Shamaim and be joined and magnified through all the ascending levels of the heavens by all who serve you therein, culminating in u- united, joyful, resounding music and a sweet savor to your very throne and your presence. Blessed be your name. May you hear us on this Kadosh day. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is one, is our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Blessed is the name of his esteemed realm forever. Baruch Shem Kivod, Malchuto, Leolam Vaye. We bless the Blessed One. Barku. Barku Yahweh Hamavorak. Baruch Yahweh Hamavorak. Leolam va e. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it cut out. Six days you will labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahweh, your Elohim. In it you will do, you will not do any work. For in six days Yahweh made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. That is why Yahweh blessed the seventh day, and appointed it as Kadosh. Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Above all, my Shabbatot you will keep, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. The Israelites are to observe the Shabbat, celebrating it for the generations to come as an enduring covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in the six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. And it will come to pass from one new month to another, and from one Shabbat to another. All flesh will come to worship before me, says Yahweh. We pray for the peace of Yerushalayim chiefly and peace on the earth. We pray for the restoration of all creation. Creation is groaning, awaiting the revealing of the Yeladim of Elohim. O oh, Father, I pray that you would put that ministry upon us, that we might be part of your great work to redeem creation mm-hmm. and restore creation, and that we might find this perhaps the greater part of our ministry as Yahad. Amen. Yes, Father. We pray for the advent of equitable justice for all living creatures. We pray for the manifestation of the visible reign of the master over all the world. Anyone who would like to unmute their mic, feel free to add your requests and your prayers now. Yeah, I'd like to uh, have our group pray for um, another group, um, an Adventist group that is bringing that is bringing the feast to the Adventist church. Um, they have a, oh, I think last feast they had 50 people there. I happen to be by there. Um and the leaders are the leaders are struggling with truth concepts, and they're, they're actually uh, having an issue with the calendar. And I think providentially, that's what kind of brought me in there. Um, so I just want to pray for them um, in going back to the Hebrew, seeing the you know just understanding the Hebrew language a little bit better, and using that as a foundational resource. So I just want to pray for them and their ministry in that regard. Curie liaison for sure. Mm-hmm. Others, let us remember our Mavakarim, overseers, Avarim, administrators, Sepharim, writers, Shotarim, ministers, Shamashim, servants, Morim, teachers, Rohim, shepherds of the Ahad, and all the people who share our faith and vision. Hallelujah.
So be it. In the name, we hear the word and teaching. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvoto, v'tzivanu la'aksan, be'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Let the prophets prophesy. <laughs> Whenever the ark set out, Moshe said, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee before you. Amen. I would like to introduce to you once again our sister and elder Marcel Loeb, who has the message today. And if you can recall, she's done a, a series of two previously on prayer. And I think she's got a different topic in mind, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Marcel? So I have new glasses today. I've got the blue light glasses, and I hope they're not too much of a reflection for you. I'm not a distraction. I don't want to be a distraction. So I missed being with you all last week. I was with my sister who is getting some new property, fulfilling a dream of hers to have a little horse farm. And the internet was unstable, and even the phone connection was not quite good enough to dial in. So um, I was glad to, to hear that everything went well, and I love our new service and having it more complete and people taking part, it is truly a blessing as I'm sure you are seeing yourself. Also, I had a little detour on the way home. I am now a grandmama. So we stopped by our oldest daughter's house to see our first grandbaby. And so that was a blessing. She's just, um, well, she's two weeks, two weeks and one day old now. So that was a blessing to see her. And those of you who are parents, or even if you're an aunt or an uncle or um, have children in your life at all, you um, probably have experienced, I guess, the responsibility and the awesomeness of a new life coming into your life. And of course, I did experience that with the children, but this grandparent is a whole new, whole new thing for me. And when we got home, I... I was pretty much overwhelmed with the idea of another generation starting um, from my family. And I was really kind of just praying that I really want to be a part of her life. And I want to pour into her life. I want to do life with her, be around her more than just visits and be able to just do those things as the Shema talks about. Speaking of him, when we walk by the way, when we retire, when we lie down, when, when we rise up. And um, so I kind of forgot about that. The next day I woke up and I do the daily office each day. It's just something I read through that kind of sets my mind and heart. The prayers are, are efficacious for me. And there's always a psalm. And I think it was on Thursday, Psalm 71. I was just reading right along. And verses, I have it here. Um, it was verse, I think it's 17 and 18. When I read over that, and you've probably had this happen. You read over a verse of scripture, especially in the Psalms, and you have to pause because it is more than just a prayer that I was reading of David. It became my prayer. So those two uh, verses say, Oh, Yahweh, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, oh, Yahweh. Do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to all the generations to come. Your power and your righteousness, O Yahweh, reaches the high heavens. So I wrote that on my chalkboard to remind me of that verse because that was really a gift for me that, that Yahweh will keep me as long as he chooses and gives me opportunity to be a blessing to teach my grandchildren about him. So that's not what my message is about today, but I wanted to go ahead and, and share that with you. Um, I'm still so new at this that I do feel the need to tell you to study out what I say. I do not consider myself to be an authority on any topic. However, it brings clarity in my own heart and mind when I plan out a message for you. 
And Jackson knows because I talk to him about what I'm going through and trying to get it together. And usually there's something, it's a, it's just about what I'm learning and something that I think is, I don't know, it's really, it really blesses me. And this may be something that you're familiar with, but hopefully there will be something fresh and new that you can take away from it. So Father, you've helped me in preparing this message. So I pray that the listeners contemplate and examine and look at anything that I'm speaking about. And I pray that it draws them closer to your son and your and yourself in his name. Amen. The topic stems from something that stood out to me while I was reading and studying and listening to different biblical scholarly lectures recently. So I want to bring to you something that's familiar and yet fresh, a message that encourages you in your faith journey. I will set the stage with some background information regarding vineyard imagery in the scriptures. So the title of my message is The True Vine. The Hebrew word for vineyard is kerem, vineyard, and it occurs over 90 times in the Old Testament. This is according to Lord Laird Harris in the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. He says the first mention of vineyards is in connection with Noah in Genesis 9.20. Grape growing was and still is an important part of Palestinian farming. The grain, new wine, and oil were the three prominent products of the field. Grapes were trodden to make juice for wine and also were dried to make raisins, which were widely used to judge from Abigail's gift to David in 1 Samuel 25 and 2 Samuel 16. Treading the wine press became a forceful figure of divine judgment. Isaiah 63, 3, Revelation 14, 19. The grapes of Palestine were part of the proof of the productivity of the land in Numbers 13, 23, especially significant because Egypt did not specialize in grapes. Vineyards were not to be picked clean, but gleanings were to be left for the poor, Leviticus 19, 10. Famous is Naboth's vineyard, his patrimony, which he would not part with, but which Ahab secured to his own destruction. That's the end of that quote. So the grapevine is mentioned more than any other plant in the Bible. Okay, so I had already been intrigued with this message of the vineyard and the vine in one study I was doing. And then I think just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity, some of you may have seen this because it was presented through Bar Magazine, that you could listen to some free lectures through Jer uh, Jerusalem University College. And it was, um, I think it was two days worth of free lectures. They didn't record them. You couldn't get their PowerPoints or anything. You just had to listen. So I took copious notes because one of the lectures was by Dr. Jack Beck. And it was on um, the, the vineyard and the vine and the imagery. And so I thought, okay, this is, I felt like that was confirmation that was supposed to continue to study this to prepare for you today. I had also listened to a course with, I think I talked about this before with Dr. Cindy Parker on the geography of the land of Israel. That's where I first kind of got intrigued with how the biblical authors used this imagery to um, present some truths to their listeners. So Merriam-Webster defines, defines viticulture as the cultivation or culture of grapes especially for winemaking. So the significance of the ancient Judean hill country viticulture is going to come into play here. Now, I've been to wineries with my adult children in various states in the South and in California, and one couple in North Carolina started their own winery as a hobby upon their retirement. So not all of them are hobbyists today. In fact, wine tasting at the visitor center for Bahat Winery in Israel was a stop on my 2019 Israel tour, and it is still family owned and operated. Viticulture was not a hobby in ancient Israel for anyone. Due to virtually no rainfall from mid-April to mid-September and no large lakes nor river systems in the Judean hill country, Deuteronomy 11 and 11 shows this where it says that the land that you're going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water by the rain from heaven. So people had to supplement their water intake with the juices of pomegranates and grapes. Fermentation was necessary to preserve the juices. Extensive ground preparation was necessary to grow crops in the rocky terrain of ancient Israel. 
you may contact us at Jackson Snyder Presents at this email address, veroyahad at gmail.com. That is V-E-R-O-Y-A-H-A-D at gmail.com. And let me remind you, you are listening to Jackson Snyder Presents with your host tonight, Bogdan G. Shromkoff. Thank you for listening. Uh, We'll be right back. Uh, Jackson Snyder Present is back. Join us now for more of uh, this interesting discussion. To first build the farmland, terracing was built that included a blocking wall and a growing bed. Topsoil had to be hauled up to the growing bed. And to cultivate just one acre took four to 12 years. Next, the vine was planted. In ancient Israel, the vines grew along the ground rather than on fences, like we see today. Native species wanted to move in. We would call them weeds but they were actually native to the terrain. And so those had to be hoed and knocked down. Pruning of the vineyard was an ongoing task so that the the good grapes would come forth. It would take four to five years for a manageable harvest. The viticulture farmers created a legacy to pass on to their children. No hobby. They were, when they went to all this work to create this, um, their vineyards, it was something that took years. So they passed it on to their children. Some farmers built towers and even moved their family into the vineyard. They also grazed livestock in the same area, therefore a barrier in the form of prickly bush. Prickly bush was planted. Once the grapes were harvested, a wine press and pressing floor had to be dug out to get the juices from the grapes. It was incredibly labor intensive to be in the viticulture business in ancient Israel. And this is from A Walk in the Judean Vineyards with Isaiah and Jesus. That's the lecture of of Dr. Jack Beck. I want to give him credit for um, this material. So the hill country of Judah, where vineyards were and are plentiful, is one of the heartland regions of ancient Israel. And it basically stretches 40 miles from Jerusalem to the north, south to the area just north of Beersheba. The hills in this region range from 2,500 to 3,000 feet above sea level. In Joshua 14, 13, and 14, we read about Joshua granting Caleb the area of Hebron as his inheritance. So this um, Kirjath Arba, Kirjath, Kiryat, probably Kiryath Arba, city of Arba, which was the early name of the city after the conquest. Uh, it was called Hebron. And Hebron was also known as the city of refuge in Joshua 20. David was anointed king and ruled from Hebron for seven years. I mention this city because to this day, it is known for having some of the best grapes in the hill country. The Judean hill country is where the Israelites first came into the promised land as chronicled in Joshua. Only as they grew did they move into other parts of the land. So because of this familiarity of the terrain, biblical authors incorporate the imagery of vines and vineyards in much of their writings and narrative as well as poetic passages. The history of the Israelites is poetically described in Psalm 8, 8 through 15, using vine and vineyard imagery. It says, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O Elohim of hosts. Look down from heaven and see, have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted for the son whom you made strong for yourself. So this is very interesting to me because I have heard, I've heard other people talk about 
the son being Israel, the son of Yahweh being Israel. So it is true that the vineyard and the vine tends to become an, an image that was adopted to represent all of Israel. That's Professor Cindy Parker. I got that from her. So more vineyard and vine imagery in the Judean hill country is portrayed in what is known as the song of the vineyard in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. So in light of my description about building the vineyard and the lecture that I saw also showed the towers. And now when I read about watchtowers in the scriptures, I have this image in my mind and it I, I just love understanding the the patterns and the and the biblical imagery of the of the agriculture of the the land around them is brought into the scriptures and those who listened originally or read the words had a better understanding and we're kind of far removed from that. So I like to bring that back in. So Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 says, let me sing for my beloved, my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes. But here's a little twist. It yielded wild grapes. Oh, and now, oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I've not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, that prickly bush, and it will be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So clearly it says right in verse seven, it states that the vineyard or the vine represent all of Israel. So with that background knowledge of viticulture and the understanding of Yahweh's care for the vineyard and Judah's response in this case, it would have been very vivid in the minds of those living in the Judean hill country where, where these words were spoken. And the fruit yielded, the, the twist here that, that no uh, viticulture farmer wants to see happen was wild grapes. So it's also translated as sour grapes from the Hebrew word beyushim, meaning stinking or worthless things. So we can see how this imagery is applied to Israel, to Judah specifically in these verses. Verse 5, removing it, its hedge to be trampled down. And I mentioned the prickly bush to keep the livestock from destroying the vine. That's being taken away. So imagine that as Yahweh's um, kind of his protection over them, making it a waste in, base, in verse 6. Basically, the vineyard would return to its natural state without being pruned and with no water. The, those invasive species, actually native species, would move back in. The land would return to its normal state. So what's going to happen to Judah when they um, when it becomes a waste? So we know uh, I didn't really mean to. I kind of went back in and added some of this. I didn't mean to expound too much upon this um, section, but I felt like it was important to talk about the connections there a little bit. And we know that the following verses after this section are um, followed by six woes. And we know that biblical woes express judgment. So it goes on. And you can read that, too, if you want to go back and do that later. But I want to go on to um, the second temple period and listen to Yahshua. And how he uses vine and vineyard imagery in John 15. So again, when I saw this, I thought this was so amazing. And then as I go on to study it and I hear other people talk about it, I said this one night when we were practicing for our liturgy that I almost wanted to stop and say, oh, maybe I should talk about something else because probably everybody knows this. And I'm going to go ahead with what I discovered here with Yeshua's speaking in John 15, 1 through 17. I'm going to read all the verses where he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you love one another. So this reference was not lost on the Israelites who heard this. Yeshua did not pull this analogy of the vine and the branches out of the blue. He knew the Tanakh. He knew the passage in Isaiah 5. And there's so many other references to to, um, vine and vineyard imagery. But through his extraordinary statement of claiming to be the true vine, he takes on the identity of all of Israel. This was quite radical when we know the history and the meaning behind the use of the vine and vineyard imagery. And this struck me too, because this passage is one that I read and think about a lot, especially when I talk about prayer and and, and abiding in Him. And it seems just so nice. (laughs) But when we think about that bold statement of Him saying, I am the true vine, you can imagine what some of His hearers, His listeners might have thought. Some not, and some probably wanted to kill it. But he taps into this imagery of the vineyard, well known to his listeners, and declares that he is the true vine, and his father is the vine dresser. I noticed as I went through this too on my own. So if you see something too that that you see differently, I'd I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. But I was comparing the imagery in Isaiah five and contrasting it with the imagery in John chapter 15. And um, Yeshua is making just this invitation. He's making a bold statement that might have ruffled the feathers of some of the uh, religious leaders that, you know, that still felt like, okay, it's Israel. You know, now you're saying that you're the true vine. This can't be. But those that received it, um, we can go back and see in John chapter 12, just before this part in 15, where Yeshua says in verse 47, that he did not come to judge Israel at the time. So it says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So to me, these scriptures imply the judgment of Yeshua will come later on the last day. And this idea of judgment to come is also spoken about in John 5, verses 19 through 29, and where we see the idea of the three class resurrections, where the second and third class of the resurrected humans will receive a trial presided over by the most equitable judge of all time. And many of you may be familiar with that message. If not, check out the archives of um, Dr. Snyder's messages. He spoke about this recently too. So the mission of the Messiah was not fully understood even by his closest disciples. And I think that sometimes it still gets mixed up today. Um, But we do have things that were explained. Even after the resurrection though, as far as his disciples go, the risen Yeshua said to his disciples in Luke 24 verses 44 through 47, it says, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. 
And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So he spoke to his disciples, and he said, um, back in verse 44, I just want to reiterate that, everything about me is written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And that it had to be fulfilled. On another note, have you ever wondered about this other section where the master was walking along with Cleopas, Cleopas and another disciple on the road to Emmaus? It says, well, this is when he first let me say he was walking along with them unrecognized. And he listened to, to them talking about what had happened in Jerusalem. And so finally he says to them, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moshe and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you like to know exactly what he said to them? Wouldn't we love to have a record of exactly what he said to them? about himself and Moshe and all the prophets. Dr. Michael Heiser in his book, The Unseen Realm says, only someone who knew the outcome of the puzzle, who knew how all the elements of the messianic mosaic would come together, could make sense of the pieces. Yeshua himself certainly knew how the pieces fit together, but we're not told exactly what he said to the two on the road to Emmaus, nor all the details of what he told his closest disciples. It's up to us to study it out. I need help. I'm thankful for the fivefold ministry. I believe in it. For um, those who are teachers and scholars who can expound and who have um, the, the, I guess, the calling to dig in and and find some of these things. One of the things I noticed, I was telling my prayer partner recently that I noticed when when I first got to know Jackson back. Um, a long time ago, about 32 years ago. And we would read over scripture and he would take the smallest things that I would just gloss over and become curious about them and study about them and find out what, what it was actually saying. And I think that was just something that really struck me and thought, oh my goodness, I have not done, I've not been diligent enough to do what I need to do to study the scriptures out. Oftentimes in Christianity, um, the New Testament is read back into the Old Testament passages erroneously. Dr. Heiser also says we shouldn't create connections where the biblical text doesn't. Instead, we need to think more carefully about what we do find in the text. So over my course, over my journey, and especially recently, well, in the past few years, I thought, why isn't it more obvious of Yeshua and who he was um, as the Messiah, as um, Israel's Messiah, so that they're not, you know, still left out and still don't see it. And so one reason that it might be so cryptic is told to us in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8, that says, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of Elohim, which Elohim decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of, the, of this age understood this, for if they had they would not have crucified the master of glory. Another quote from Dr. Heiser says that the Old Testament profile of the Messiah was deliberately veiled, end quote. Otherwise, Yahweh's plan for Yahshua would not have happened as we know it. And you can go back through the Gospels. Different things are coming to my mind of where he said things and the the crowds wanted to kill him. And, and it wasn't time yet. There were still things that he had to do. To, um, times in the Gospel where they were ready to throw him over the cliff and then they just stopped and he walked right through the middle of them. Um, so, so he spoke in parables. And that's another thing I'm studying too um, because it wasn't time to reveal who he was. So some of you listening may have friends or acquaintances Who've, re who've rejected Yeshua as Messiah after they practiced a Torah observant faith. I've known of a few and I've heard of others, and this is grievous and it ought not to happen. Did we come to the Torah because we just fell in love with the Torah? I'd say most of us came to embrace the Shabbat, the Moedim, the observance of the food ordinances, and more through our journey with the Master Yeshua Messiah. 
why walk away from him? Hopefully we can continue to seek out his ways that we can honor and keep his commandments, his statutes, his ordinances, and his testimonies, not to earn his love, but rather because of his love for us first. And while you're doing that, I challenge you along with myself to abide in the Master Yeshua. Learn from him, as he says, along with being diligent to study, be just as diligent in communing with him. And they go together. He will prune us to bear good fruit, to make us into his image. The grapes of the best wine is what we want to be, and we want to remain in his and his father's love to our very last day. So, Father, we thank you as the vine dresser for giving us your son, Yeshua, the true vine. Tend to us so that we are choice branches as we abide in him, bearing much fruit to the honor of your great name and all of the universe. Le'olam va'ed. Amen. Hasten. Amen and amen. Let's go back to our liturgy now. That's a great message. Thank you. When, when the ark rested, Moshe said, Return, O Yahweh, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. We pray the Master's prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in the sky, may your name be sanctified. May your reign be blessed, your will be done, in sky and land. Continually give us our bread, forgive us our sin debt, as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Do not bring us into the nets of a snare. And protect us from the evil one. Amen. Our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the Torah of the beloved Son's nation and to the divine theocracy for which it stands. One Eloha, one nation, one head, one faith, one attitude, one goal, one baptism, one communion, one body, all ordained by Yahweh the Creator. Our nation is surely indivisible with divine liberty, equitable justice, and eternal life for all. Hallelujah. Amen. We minister Shalom. May your departure be in Shalom. Malachim of Shalom. Malachim of the El Elyon. Coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereign. Kadosh one, blessed is he. Say, Kim Shalom, Malachi Shalom, Malachi Elion, Nihimelet Malachi Hamasi, Akadosh Baruchi. We sing the song of peace. Shalom to you now, by hovering. May Yahweh's mercy bless you well, my friends, in all your living and through your loving. Yahweh be your shalom, shalom, shalom. Yahweh be your shalom. Blessing. <laughs> I 
Cloaked in holiness, cloaked in holiness. 